pediatric gastroenterologist. I look after people's guts. I'm an allergist. I look after people's allergic responses or try to diagnose them. And I run a busy clinic with sick, tired and grumpy children. And I've been interested in the gluten thing for probably two decades. And I know that you have become very interested in gluten issues and now have extended that to look at all grains. And this is the book that you've written, No Grain, No Pain. And I'm fascinated about this. So my first question, Peter, is what was your journey towards understanding that gluten and wheat were a problem and how did that extend to all grains? That's a great question. I think we first got started in the clinic in, in, uh, in, in 2001. And what we were finding is people with autoimmune disease would respond really, really well to the what I call the traditional gluten-free diet, the wheat, the barley, the rye um, free diet, sometimes oats, sometimes not, depending on, as you know, whether or not they're certified, et cetera. But one of the things that kept happening was we would get patients back in the office you know, many weeks after their success. And what, what, what I found clinically is that they started gravitating toward gluten-free breads, gluten-free pastas, gluten-free products. And um, so fundamentally what was happening or what I was noticing is that as they gravitated toward those products, their symptoms returned. Now, all that being said, I also went gluten-free uh, after finding uh, about my gluten sensitivity. And what I found is that the gluten-free products made me feel absolutely worse than if I were to eat wheat, barley, and rye. And, and it was something of, of frustration for me because I'm here I am, I'm, I'm first, I'm supposed to be the guy who knows all about this stuff and here I am using it and it's making me feel worse. And I know that, you know, that my patients are experiencing the same thing. So it led me to kind of a fundamental process of investigation. The first thing I really wanted to understand better was I wanted to understand where the definition of gluten came from, like the true origin of the definition of gluten and celiac disease and gluten sensitivity, because there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of hearsay. There was a lot of anecdote. There were a lot of people saying one thing, saying another thing. So I actually went to the source. I went to botanists and I, I wanted to know what actually gluten was. And that led me to TJ to Osborne's work at you know, TJ Osborne, the, the, the father of plant chemistry, of plant protein chemistry, actually was the original yeah. person who classified glutens as prolamins and glutalins and being soluble in alcohol, et cetera. And so, but, but it led to the discovery that corn has a form of gluten, actually many forms of gluten. Rice has forms of gluten. Sorghum has forms of gluten. And so my, my question then naturally became if taking a patient who's gluten sensitive, gluten free leads to a remission until they start introducing other forms of grain uh, containing gluten, what's, what's the gravitation there? What is, what is the actual process of what's involved? And so I actually started diving into medical literature and what I was able to find, I found studies as early as the 60s on corn gluten. Um, and in particular, the one that really, the really sealed it for me was a study done in 2012 by a group in South America. What they found is that corn gluten interacted with the HLA-DQ receptor and caused inflammation to a greater degree than wheat gluten did. And so that, that was, you know, identifying and isolating and finding those studies, finding that rice that we always thought was so um, hypoallergenic, not, not allergenic forming. Um and finding numerous studies on how rice causes enterocolitis and that using rice substitutes would, would lead to massive quantities of the diagnosis of enterocolitis or, re, or return of enterocolitis. It was where I really began the process, at least from a medical perspective in, in terms of research. And then I just started applying it. And as I applied it, I noticed that these patients who got sicker, when we removed the rest of the grain, guess what happened? They got better again. And so that, yeah, that was kind yeah. of step one for me. Yeah, that's interesting. In my clinic, I see a lot of children. I'm a pediatrician. And when I broach the area of trial a gluten-free diet, like everybody else, they go into a sort of bit of a panic and they wonder what they can eat instead. And they say, well, there's nothing I can eat. And so I tell them that there is a gluten-free alternative to everything they're eating currently, but those gluten-free alternatives aren't necessarily a healthy choice. 
But to begin to get these children onto a gluten-free diet, I couldn't imagine them accepting a grain-free diet from the start. So how do you begin to transition your patients from a gluten-free diet through to no grain? Or do you tell your patients to go no grain for the 30 days that you are talking about in your book? So how do you, how do you convince your patients that they should quit all grains and not take the gluten gluten-free alternatives? There are several ways. Um, one is, is we have meetings in the clinic and uh, in, in, these are very, very lengthy meetings and we'll go hour and a half, two hours into the why and I'll give them options and we'll give them, uh, we have a foundation, glutenfreesociety.org is our foundation um, and we have recipe ideas and, and different aspects of things they can tap into. We have edit, we have um, video tutorials that people can watch to prolong their education and, and to accelerate the whole learning curve. The reality is that many of my patients come to me after the gluten-free diet has already failed them. Um, I've kind of got a reputation for that. So in my clinic, it's probably a little bit easier to convince them because they're suffering with severe autoimmune conditions. Medicine has completely failed to help their situations. Diet change has completely failed to help their situations. So we go through the process of advanced allergy testing, genetic testing, and I, I, I lay it out in front of them and it's very blueprinted to their own uniqueness. And so they have two options. They have an option to follow through and get better, or they have an option to you know, complain about the diet and not really wanna do it and not get better. And again, for my patient population, it's probably easier than for yours dealing with pediatrics um, in, that, in that these people are so sick, they, they really don't have another option. So it's really not a barrier for them. Now I will get patients who, who will struggle and say, this is too much, I need to wean into this, to which my response is, I would ra much rather see you wean into it than dismiss it altogether. So let me guide you through that process. As long as you're honest with me, uh, I, won't, I won't look yeah. bad upon you. I won't look down at you. I'm here, for, I'm here to help. So if there are people that need to wean, I, I certainly... I certainly welcome that if that's their personality under the auspice that they understand that, that ultimately grain free is where they need to be. Yeah, I understand that. Uh, Peter, I was very interested in reading your book cover to cover. One of the areas I was trying to um, dissect out is where you would define a grain versus a seed or a bean and that of these, both the grain and the seed and also the, the beans, they all grow, you plant them in the soil and they will sprout. They all need some sort of storage protein, they all need some sort of protein to get them out of the ground and start growing. And in your book, again, you mentioned that some of the beans can upset these uh, your patients as well. So is, is there anything that can sprout can be a problem? I, I would say the answer to that is probably yes, um, as it relates to seeds and legumes, and not necessarily for the same reason that we might see a true gluten sensitivity. So if we've got somebody with a true identifiable immunological response to gluten, um, and we know they need to avoid it because they're having an immunological response, it's very different than somebody who's had a digestive tract that's damaged and just not capable of fundamentally being able to process a difficult to digest food which beans and seeds are, as you know, they, they've got a, how, a hard outer layer, um, which is very hard to get to. It's very hard to digest through. And internally, we've I, actually, there was a study done. There's been a number of studies in the past five years, but one of them in particular identified five new classes of proteins found within grains and seeds. Um, probably the most noted was the ATI, the amylase trypsin inhibitors, which actually stop pancreatic function in humans. So it shunts pancreatic enzyme release. And I, I think if we look at seeds in general and we say, look, they have to have some degree or ability to protect themselves from predation, from predators. They don't have, you know, they can't walk away. They don't have arms. They can't fight back. So what is it that they use as a, as a weapon? They have to use biochemistry. And I think that we have just um, taking a lot of very sick guts with chronic antibiotic use and in, in, in the U.S., chronic antibiotics and GMOs 
and antacid medications and other drugs that would inhibit or otherwise slow down the process of the gut's function. And then we ask the gut to do the job uh, to its normal capacity, you know, and to digest things that are relatively hard to digest, even if it were working on all cylinders. And now we have this, this, uh, this process of, you know, the digestion can't happen because the gut is so compromised and now we're asking it to do such a greater degree of work and it doesn't ever get a break, right? You know, if we work out, we take a few days off and let the soreness heal, but we eat three times a day plus snacks. So the gut, you know, we call it a fast or break fast because we're breaking a fast, you know, the nighttime fast, but beyond somebody going to bed and then sleeping and waking up, there's very few people will actually fast their guts as a process to allow it to heal. And so one of the things that I see clinically is that if we can, if, if a person can tolerate a fast, you know, several times a week, and if they can uh, omit some of these harder to digest legumes and seeds, then their recovery times and response times to heal is much, much faster than if they eat six small meals a day and, and continue to use bean flours. That's one of the, one of the ones that I see a lot, you know, a lot of these gluten-free products are bean flour based. And so they're baking cupcakes and cookies and things out of bean flour. And again, it's just wrecking their guts, not allowing it to recover fully. Exactly. These seeds over the millennia, many of them have been developed so that they will actually sprout once they've gone through a bird or animal digestive tract. So the seeds themselves are actually um, made so that they do sprout only after they've passed through an animal. So obviously they are hard to digest. If you grind them up like a flour or a seed, if you grind up the seeds, do you think they're equally as harmful? I think many of the chemical compounds within the, the endosperm layer of seeds, so that inner layer inside the, you know, the meal or the, or the germ, the, I think many of those proteins are equally as harmful because their whole premise and purpose is to protect the germ. And if we open that up and then, and then allow that to be released in our GI tracts, we can create a problem. Um, I think also mm -hmm. there's something else left unsaid there is that, you know, much of what we've done in, 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 um, and seed hybridization and some genetic manipulation is we've trained seeds to survive better, right? We've actually armed them with better innate defense systems so that now they're even stronger against our own digestive capacity. So I think there's, there's a role to play in the modernization of, of farming as well. Exactly. Once someone has gone through your program, you talk about the 30 day program, then you talk about sustaining the, uh, their diet. Do you allow your patients to go back onto some of the traditional gluten-free grains or are you encouraging them to remain grain-free lifelong? I'm encouraging them to remain grain-free. Um, several reasons why. One is there's not enough science in the gluten world, in the celiac world, to say that grain, other grain, gluten grains are safe. There's science, plenty of science that says that when we study certain ones that they're very dangerous, but there aren't really long-term studies showing that they're safe. And so I would rather default to, to playing it safe with a patient, but then you also have other elements within grain. And this may be different in other countries, but in the United States, which is where I'm at and where my patients are at for the most part, we've got glyphosate and Roundup to worry about. We've got atrazine to worry about. We've got mold mycotoxins like aflatoxin and fumonisin in the corn that we have to worry about. So it's not, you know, we talk about gluten and everybody is, is really just like on the back of gluten as if gluten were the, the worst Satanistic protein ever, but it's more than gluten. I think, I think that's where the evolution of this conversation needs to go. It's really beyond gluten. And we have to look at the quality of the food and the quality of the way that it's grown and what's being done to the food as it's being grown what's doing to the food to make it grow faster, et cetera. And, and that's one of the reasons why my recommendation is, look, until we have some real sound science that says that, you know, for somebody with a gluten sensitivity that says that gluten's of any kind of grain beyond wheat, barley, and rye is safe, then my recommendation is to play it safe and to keep them off. And, and my experience in that, in that arena is for 15 years is that my patient's track records will speak for themselves and that they get better and they stay better 
Whereas the first five years of practice, Rodney, I had, I actually gave it a name. I called it gluten-free whiplash because they would, they would go off of wheat, barley, rye. They would find corn, rice, and sorghum, and then they would go backwards again. And then we, once we got those other grains out and kept them out, they wouldn't, they would no longer have that whiplash effect. Yeah. A few years ago, I wrote a book called Gluten Zero, and I laid out the argument for everybody globally to quit gluten. And I was talking about the traditional gluten grains of wheat, rye, and barley, and oats. That would you <clears throat> would you have an argument to <clears throat> keep everybody grain free? Would 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 you think that a global adoption of grain free would benefit people's health without I, people without symptoms or without disease at this stage well i think i think we have to ask the question fundamentally where does disease come from and if we have you know with a with gluten sensitivity based diseases we're looking at three to four decades before the disease surfaces well enough to be able to render a diagnosis so i think you very much could make a valid argument that that you know um altering grain consumption on, on, a, on a global level would probably lead to a remission and a dramatic improvement in the overall state of our health. If we look at the policies, your government as well as my government, Canada, and many other Western governments, uh, European governments, they adopt a high grain influx policy. And, and every one of these cultures has higher degrees of grain-based or gluten-based diseases. And so I think I think certainly there's an argument that could be made for it. I think on the on the opposite side, I think what we would hear is that you know, um, are humans so weak that they can't actually process something, even if it's every once in a while, or is 20 parts per million too aggressive, you know? But I think as a as an overall scope, I think if we just ask one fundamental question, is it safe to consume a food that's biochemically designed to kill predators uh, as a staple source in our diets? and call it okay. And, and, and then on top of that, add pesticide and add genetic hybridization and add genetic manipulation and add uh, fungal storage properties. And now, you, you know, you have a big poison. And I think, I think you could very much make the argument that taking grain out of the diets, even, even wheat, barley, rye, and oats, as you argued in, in gluten global zero, um, I, I think you could very much argue that scientifically and be right and see the results go toward a better health state. Yes. When, we talk about vegetarians, they require the beans, seeds and grains for their protein and vegetarians are stuck from that point of view. People going on the no grain, no pain diet, they get quite a bit of protein from meat. Can you talk a little bit more about protein requirements and how people might get this off no grain? Yeah, I mean, pro protein requirements, if, if a person's willing to eat animal meat, are very easy to achieve. I mean, the average adult needs, you know, roughly 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight to sustain normal function. And, I mean, you could go higher. There's some studies that, that warn against kidney disease if you go higher, but there are also some studies that show if you go higher, you actually improve the health of that individual. I think what it really boils down to is, is the concept of, you know, um, the famous biochemist Roger Williams put it the most eloquently, the concept of biochemical individuality is that there is no one exact right for absolutely everybody and that there's a big part of uniqueness that plays into this. I have patients that do well on a vegetarian diet, primarily when I say vegetarian, maybe I should refrain and say pesco vegetarian, meaning less red meats and uh, easier to digest meats like fish. Um, but, but from the perspective of being completely meat free, there are some people who thrive in that and then they have the right biochemistry to thrive in that type of environment. I've seen it clinically. Um, I also see many people who, who want to be vegetarian and it's not the right move for them and they end up becoming anemic and, and B12 deficient and iron deficient and zinc and vitamin B6 deficient. And they end up suffering immunodeficiency problems. They don't get heart disease, but they have neurological and immune problems. And so you know, I think, I think again, it, it boils down to individuality, but protein requirements being on, on my program um, can be met through vegetables, can be met through certain beans, uh, if properly prepared to reduce the digestive, uh, the digestive stress, and can be properly met through um, 
through a balance of supplementation if that's what needs to happen in order to get that person to heal. The conundrum in very sick people, as you know, is that many of them in order to heal require vast more quantities of protein. So in the average healthy person needing 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram, somebody who's very sick and needs the protein for inflammatory repair might require 1.2 to 1.4 grams of protein per kilogram body weight. And you can't do that on a vegetarian diet. So it makes it, makes it a conundrum. So we sometimes have to use protein powders, organic protein powders of, of a of a vegetarian base with a complex of complete amino acids to be able to get them to overcome those issues. But again, that, that usually I reserve and base it on individual needs based on that person's, uh, what that person's diet needs to be. Mm. So Peter, I was most impressed reading the book and I certainly will be reassessing some of my more chronic difficult patients in pediatrics. The children tend not to be as sick, some are very sick, but not as sick as uh, an adult who's been eating the wrong food for the last 50 or 60 years. What would you recommend to a, a family with a young, uh, uh, young parents with young kids and they're wondering what to eat, they wonder whether they should be eating meat because of the new cancer scare on that, and they wonder about the sugar and the obesity, and they wonder about the effects of gluten. What, what would you recommend to a starting out family, how to feed their kids? I'd say first, fundamentally, we have to recognize that real food is the most important lesson. You, you've got to have real food, meaning avoidance of packaged processed as much as possible, uh, because conveniences, today's conveniences are, are largely chemically loaded and uh, they set us up for failure in terms of our health. So first lesson would be, look, let's understand that real food is important. Second of all, let's understand that, um, look, everybody's needs are different. One man's food is another man's poison. And, and we, I, I usually teach my patients three rules as it relates to nutrition. The first rule is you cannot expect to achieve health or maintain it eating food that isn't healthy. And so I, that rule, I really call the common sense rule because then I, you know, we can say, okay, is soda healthy? Obviously it's not. Is a Snickers candy bar healthy? No. Are Doritos chips healthy? No. Um, not even if they were organic, they wouldn't be healthy. And so, you know, the common sense rule is, is the first rule. The second rule is don't eat what you're allergic, sensitive, or intolerant to. And, and so in my clinic, I go through the process of actually differentiating that out with my individual patients. I, I, for me, it's very important to do that in order for somebody to get healthy. And then the third rule is, is listen to your body, regardless of what any doctor or any, any wise nutritionist or, or anyone tells you or any lab test for that matter. If you eat something and feel bad eating it, stop eating it. You have to learn to listen to the wisdom of how your body speaks to you. And if you can apply those three rules, you'll do 90% better than, than most people do currently. And, um, and I think that's where we have to start. We have to start from the fundamental premise that food is medicine. Food can be a drug. Food can be a poison. Food can affect us in great ways, but food can also affect us in detrimental ways. And if we respect it and we learn to respect and understand it to a higher degree, I think um, anybody can be taught to, um, to improve their diet and improve their health as a result of, of those messages. I agree entirely, Peter. I had a patient yesterday whose mother was very keen to give this child what she called some real food. This child's got multiple food allergy and was off dairy, wheat, egg, corn, and peanut. And the child was eating beautifully, eating veg fresh vegetables, fresh fruits, having meat and fish, and uh, having a little bit of rice and having a special nutritional supplement and child's doing beautifully. And I said, well, your child is on real food and doing well. Why would you want to add these foods that they're allergic to? She said, well, um, I want my child to have real food. And she was seeing real food as packet food, things she could buy in the supermarket, something that was easy and convenient for her. And so she's been brainwashed by the supermarket and her 20 years of upbringing. There's a huge resistance to have a one ingredient food. And uh, I, I quite like the idea, I can't remember who said it, but uh, if you read a label and you can't imagine what that food looks like from the point of view of food, then don't eat it. 
Yeah. And I, my children might eat anything which has more than four ingredients on the packet. So it takes a lot of education. And sometimes I feel overwhelmed by my little voice in the huge food industry budget advertising. Is there a message you have there, Peter? Yeah, I agree. I think I think it has to be done from a grassroots effort. I don't think that that clinics like yours and mine and there are a number of others across the world that are, are striving and, and providing similar messages. We certainly don't have the advertising budgets um, or marketing teams or marketing uh, techniques to dispense massively uh, to compete with with this propagandized message. And, and in the U.S., I know for certain the government he actually takes taxpayer dollars to basically to subsidize the growth of grain uh, in mass production the way that it's done. So you're not going to change that. That's not something that I'm going to be able to change as a singular person. But at, on a grassroots level, we start with one person at a time. You know, it's funny. Truth has a way of, of, of finding itself to the surface. In other words, it resonates in people's ears. And what is required, I think, here is enough people have to be sick to make change in their own life, right? So that we build a, a grassroots anecdote that is so overwhelming that it can no longer be ignored. And uh, and we've actually started to see that happen. I, I know we talked a number of years ago, Rodney, and, and uh, just in that time, from then to now, look how much has actually come to the forefront and changed. Um, and I think we're gonna see that continue to happen over the next 10 to 15 years in, in mass because of of, of uh, internet technology and, and functional medicine summits and, and other doctors like us that are out there uh, teaching these messages and, and providing, quite frankly, very miraculous results. When you can take a patient who's been told there's nothing that they can do about their disease and that they just have to learn to live with it and it's a potentially terminal disease and you can completely put that into remission with food um, and you do that enough times and it spreads enough times, you can't keep that truth down. That truth is, is eventually going to make its way to the surface. And even there's an evolution, or I say an evolution, but a revolution amongst the medical professionals who, you know, you trained classically. I tra I was fortunate. I trained non-classically. But, um, but you found nutrition. You found nutrition. Uh, even after being trained classically, you found it and you, you applied it. And I think a lot of doctors now are so frustrated um, with the healthcare system and the way that it's put them in chains and the way that it's put them in, into kind of a box where they have to practice it. And they're identifying nutrition and they're coming to terms that, that there's a better and a different way and they're seeing it and their patients are telling them about it. Um, I think we're going to see a revolution in, this, in, in our country, especially in the next 10 years. And it, and it begins with the grassroots. But I think when the doctors change the standard of care, the insurance companies have no choice but to follow suit. And subsequently, the people have no choice but to follow suit, because if the message is loud and resoundingly clear and unified, then we, we will no longer have the disgruntled people saying, well, we want to eat, you know, processed packaged foods so that we can feel normal. I think w normal will change and normal will be strong and healthy and vibrant as opposed to sick, but socially relevant. And right now we have a sick but socially, inter and, you know, people look at food and they want to ha hang out and have these social interactions and they don't want to look at the consequences of that. But I think we're coming to the end of that, I think. And I, like I said, I think we'll see that in the next 10 to 15 years really, really start to blossom. Well, that's a very optimistic note to end on. I believe that every medical practitioner and as many interested people in the community should read your book and understand what the meaning of beyond gluten-free is. And I congratulate you and thank you for your wonderful crusade of helping so many sick people with good nutrition. So thank you very much, Peter. Well, thank you too. And I appreciate all you've done and all the books that you've written and, and, and your mission as well. You, uh, I don't think anybody can say they could match Rodney Ford and, and reaching the world about not eating gluten. So thank you for all you do as well. Okay, be in touch. Okay. Thank you. Take care. Yeah, I think that's nice.